Well, thank you very much. Welcome everyone to our webinar with Itamar Rabinovich, who is here to discuss uh, his newest book, Middle Eastern Maze, Israel, the Arabs and the Region, 1948 to 2022. Before we begin, I wanna thank our co-sponsors for today's webinar, the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, uh, and my department at UCLA, the Department of Public Policy and the Luskin School of Public Affairs. Uh, we're very, very lucky uh, to have such a distinguished guest uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you may happen to be. Uh, Itamar Rabinovich was the Israeli ambassador to the United States of America uh, during the Clinton presidency. Uh, he also served as the president of Tel Aviv University and ambassador, if you could turn your camera on so we can see you. I'm gonna uh, uh, go straight to my first question, uh, but I wanna emphasize that uh, rather than me asking all the questions, uh, we wanna make this as interactive as possible. And so please be thinking of the questions that you would like to ask Ambassador Rabinovich, and I will uh, get to those questions as soon as I possibly can, but let's begin uh, and welcome Ambassador. Thank you so much for being with us uh, from um, uh, your beautiful library there. Um, maybe you could begin by just describing the book. I know it's an update of an earlier book that you wrote, covers a huge amount of, of, of ground. Uh, if you could just describe the book for us and then I'll launch into a couple of questions and we'll go from there. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Steve, and good evening to all those who uh, are attending this event. Um, this is actually a, a third version. When, when I ended my mission in, in Washington in uh, 1996, I decided to write two books. One was my account of my negotiations with uh, Syria, and the second was an overview of uh, Arab-Israeli relations and the peace process. That was uh, published in 1998. Uh, 14 years later, in 2012, so much has happened that I decided to write uh, a new version, which I called uh, The Lingering Conflict. And now, 10 years later, again, so much has happened that I decided to write a third version. I would say about 40% different from the, from the previous one. Uh, it has, uh, it covers uh, the second Obama term, the uh, uh, <clears throat> Trump uh, presidency, and the first uh, two years of the, uh, the Biden administration. And of course, many developments uh, here in the region in terms of Arab-Israeli uh, uh, relations. Uh, primarily, the most innovative element is the Abraham uh, Accords. And uh, at the very end, I'm, I added an addendum that uh, deals with uh, events since the formation of the new Israeli government and what is known uh, euphemistically as the uh, judicial reform launched by the new Israeli government. Israel is now in turmoil uh, domestically. Uh, that is not covered so much in, uh, in the book. I'm not volunteering to do a fourth edition. Um, but uh, let me say this about the book. the book. The book has two parts. The bulk of it is narrative. Uh, it tells the story from 48 to the present with an emphasis on the period beginning with the peace process of the 1990s and taking us almost to, to the present. But uh, then there are two analytical chapters. One is called Peace and Normalization, and it uh, uh, describes, analyzes the concept of peace both on the Arab side and on the Israeli side. And uh, the second uh, is called the web of relationships. And the argument there is that uh, there isn't a single Arab-Israeli conflict or a single Arab-Israeli relationship, that uh, there's a whole host of relationships, that Israel's relationship with Egypt is different from the one it has with Syria and with Jordan and the one it has with Saudi Arabia. And each of these relationships is given a few, uh, a few pages. So these are the two analytical chapters. Okay, thank you so much. And, and of course, I think we need to begin um, with the current situation in Israel. I'm sure it's on the minds of many, many people uh, in the audience. Um, and uh, we've obviously seen uh, the demonstrations in the streets, uh, hundreds of thousands of Israelis coming out to protest the uh, judicial quote-unquote reform package uh, proposed by the uh, new Netanyahu government. Uh, we had a very serious development just a week ago 
the Sunday or so when Netanyahu fired or purported to fire uh, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, the day after the Defense Minister went on television and criticized the the, the hard push uh, to try to ramrod these reforms, so-called reforms through the Knesset. Ambassador, where is all this heading? Uh, what kind of off-ramp do you foresee from this crisis? And how is this crisis uh, impacting this web of relationships, uh, Israel's relationships with its neighbors, with the United States, uh, others in the region? Can you can you kind of give us both the perspective from within Israel and then and then uh, help us understand the broader implications of what is happening in the country right now? Uh, sure, uh, you know, famously uh, when. Uh, Kissinger conducted his uh, shuttle diplomacy after the 73 war. He used to complain that Israel has no foreign policy, it only has domestic policy or politics because uh, he spent quite a lot of time dealing with the differences and uh, uh, quarrels between uh, the, the main characters, Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan, and, uh, and so forth, uh, with his caustic sense of humor. That's, uh, that's what he said. Well, we now have basically a domestic problem that spills over immediately into our regional and international relations. So what we had was uh, after uh, more than a year of uh, a government without Netanyahu, the, the Bennett Lapid government, that government uh, collapsed, lost out, and the elections of uh, November 2022, uh, Netanyahu and uh, his allies won, not by, by a small margin. I mean, they have uh, a majority of 64 out of 120, you remember that you needed 361 uh, to form a coalition. So it's only three above, uh, above the red lines. It's not that they were given a, a sweeping mandate of uh, 80 seats in, uh, in the Knesset. And it turned out that uh, what they want to accomplish uh, full force was a, a, legal, uh, a legal judicial reform um, uh, whose uh, main accent is uh, to take away the power of the Supreme Court uh, and primarily by uh, turning the uh, process of electing judges from the current process, which is quite complex, um, into a process whereby the government chooses the, uh, the judges. Now, uh, Americans may not be... Uh, uh, all, all that shocked by this because uh, in, in your Supreme Court is, is elected uh, by politicians and uh, they are confirmed by, uh, by the Senate. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't have a constitution. We don't have uh, a real separation of, uh, of powers. Uh, uh, the government controls the legislature and the only check on the power of the government is the Supreme Court. And clearly the agenda is to uh, emasculate the Supreme Court in order to enable this coalition uh, to put through uh, a very massive legislation that would empower the, uh, uh, the, the government. Um, we, we get some inklings of this. They try to nationalize the National Library. They try to nationalize the Bureau of Statistics. I mean, the real appetite uh, for, uh, for taking control. Second, it's the most uh, right-wing government we uh, we ever had um, with uh, some very radical elements that they became famous or infamous around the world for some of their uh, statements and uh, and actions um, and uh, if, if they are empowered and stay in power for a long time of course it would have massive uh, a massive impact on our foreign relations in relations with the Arab minority inside Israel, relations with the Palestinians, relations with our new partners in the Abraham Accord, all the partners like Egypt and Jordan, and, and of course the United States. The United States made no secret of the fact, or the president himself made no secret of the fact that he opposes this uh, trend by the government, expects it to uh, reverse course. Um, the response by the extreme right wing is, uh, who, who cares about America, who needs America? Well, we do, and, uh, and so uh, a debate on, on foreign policy is intertwined uh, into this uh, domestic issue. The, uh, the civil lining in all of this is the mobilization of the civil society. 
you mentioned before the firing uh, of the Minister of Defense. Within an hour, within an hour, tens of thousands of people were on, on the street demonstrating. And uh, actually to date, uh, the Prime Minister uh, has not completed the process of firing the Minister, has not sent him uh, a letter. Uh, there is the pressure of the uh, protest movement and I believe that more discreetly also by the U.S. government that uh, indicated to to, the, to Netanyahu that uh, they they like working with the uh, Minister of Defense Gallant. They don't want to see him replaced. So how is all this going to end, though? Uh, <coughs> will we have to... Oh, I don't want to use see, the word hope. Yeah. I want I to be neutral. To, yeah. But let me just finish. Right. I want to be neutral here, so I don't want to say hope, but, but do you see the... Um, some of the less right-wing ideologues may be defecting from the coalition. You mentioned the thin majority that is um, keeping the government in power. Is is there maybe some deal here to uh, keep Netanyahu out of jail? Interesting that we're talking about it today when Trump is about to be arraigned in New York. Um, what what how did how is this going to end, Ambassador? Well, it's. Uh... And I see a, number, a couple of scenarios. One is that there is now an effort to, to reach an understanding. And two delegations representing the coalition and the opposition are meeting in the presidential mansion, trying to work out a compromise. And they have about a month to do that. I'm not terribly optimistic about, uh, about this. And Netanyahu may decide that... Uh, he really doesn't have the political power to do that. They are declining dramatically in the polls. If elections were to be held now, the opposition would win. Um, and people in his own party are very unhappy. The world is unhappy. He may come to his senses, in my view, and uh, decide that this all should be postponed for a year. That's a very optimistic scenario, not very likely. The other is that they decide to go all the way since the, uh, the laws are ready, they, they can be legislated in a matter of a day and a half. And then it is likely that there would be appeals to the Supreme Court, injunctions to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is likely to throw out the legislation. And then either Netanyahu says, okay, gentlemen, I tried, and the uh, Supreme Court stopped me, or decides to try to proceed, and then we would be in the midst of a very, very profound uh, constitutional crisis. Uh, I can't tell you now uh, which, which scenario is likely to materialize. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me just ask one more question about this. And this, I think, will transition us to a discussion of the Abraham Accords and the Palestinian track as well. Is the motivation for uh, uh, weakening the Supreme Court and changing the selection process so that a simple majority of five out of nine members of the selection committee, all from the government, by the way, can pick whoever they want and put them on the court, essentially um, uh, converting the court into an organ of the ruling party. I, I call that annexing the court. It's a form of annexation of what should be an independent branch of government. Um, what is motivating this? What's driving this? Is it a desire? Uh, by the right to move forward uh, with annexation of the Jordan Valley, notwithstanding Netanyahu's commitment to the United Arab Emirates that he wouldn't do that, at least for a period of four years as part of the, the uh, uh, price for the Abraham Accords? Or, or is the motivation here to uh, prevent um, uh, the court from getting in the way of immunizing Netanyahu from his criminal liability? What, what is really motivating the, this this march forward to weaken the Supreme Court. Well, I expect that Netanyahu, of course, has a personal uh, uh, stake in here, um, in a way to select the judges that would end up sitting on his appeal or any any such any such development. Um, but there is a larger agenda here. There are several groups in the country that dislike the Supreme Court. We ultra orthodox because. Uh, of several rulings that they uh, disliked, the radical or the right wing, because uh, the Supreme Court has been a protector 
uh, of the rights of the Palestinians in the West Bank or the right wing in general, because the Supreme Court under uh, former justice, the Chief Justice Aaron Barak promoted um, a formula. He, uh, he said Israel is a Jewish state. It's also a democratic state. We don't have a constitution, but we have basic laws. Most important one is from 1992, the dignity of man. And under the banner of that law, Aaron Barak the, uh, and his court did quite a bit to protect uh, Israeli Arabs and, and Palestinians. The right wing doesn't like that. So they, they would like to change all of that. Now, in the coalition are uh, 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 two partners, the Smotrich and Mr. Ben Gvir, who are extreme right wingers, anti Arab, anti Palestinian. They would like not to annex the Jordan Valley, they would like to annex the whole West Bank. And, you know, they are not shy about it. Uh, uh, I recommend um, anyone can Google uh, Bezalel Smotrich, the decision plan 2017, and there's a full text in which he explains what his, uh, what his plan is. Um, now, they, they know that the formation of this uh, uh, coalition government uh, is uh, a unique situation. It may not repeat itself. And so they're in a hurry. They want to uh, to get everything done quickly uh, before the tide changes in the country. Uh, thank you. We do have a question from uh, one of our audience members, my dear friend Sima Kalicholu from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, sh her question is uh, to you, Ambassador, do you think that the Netanyahu government or another like-minded right-wing government uh, is uh, posing a threat to the future of the Abraham Accords and the regional momentum that, that seemed to be building toward normalization, but more recently seems to have stalled? Um, ultimately, yes. I mean, uh, so far, the, uh, there's been some negative impact on the Abraham Accord, not on the Accords itself, but on the efforts to continue them. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a summit meeting called the Negev Summit in which the, partner, the parties to the Abraham Accord and the United States participated. There were to be two follow-up meetings now and, and they have been postponed. That's, that's obviously a negative sign. And, uh, and of course, if, uh, if the government stays in power and it pursues an anti-Israeli Arab minority and anti-Palestinian policy, it would have an impact. I mean, in uh, Jordan is very sensitive. And let me add the Temple Mount uh, which is a very sensitive issue, not just for Jordan, but for uh, all Arabs and, uh, and Muslims. Uh, and so in the long run, uh, if this government stays in power and, and continues a radical right-wing uh, uh, policy, um, the future of the Abraham Accords is in jeopardy. And it's interesting uh, that our questioner was from Turkey. Turkey uh, and Israel have um, amended fences recently to some extent. President Herzog was there and and uh, the, the the hostility in that relationship seems to have, have diminished somewhat. Uh, Oman opened its airspace to Israeli uh, civilian aircraft recently. But then we had China come into the region and broker a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And this is the maze, I suppose, that you're talking about, Ambassador. And what are we to make of all of these moving parts when we try to assess the future of the Abraham Accords process? Well, I think the uh, original and international politics of the region are in flux. Uh, you mentioned China coming in um, and, and playing a role in, uh, in making amends between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. This is new. And, uh, and MBZ, uh, <clears throat> MBS must have known very well uh, what, what he was doing. And it's not, not the only step, right? Uh, just recently we heard that they are now cutting production, uh, oil production yet again. So another blow uh, for, for US policy uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, Turkey is, uh, is a difficult uh, NATO, uh, NATO partner as its uh, own relationship with uh, Russia and uh, um, not the warm relationship that the U.S. and Turkey had in uh, had in uh, had in the past. Um, so uh, Russia 
is uh, is in Syria. Of course, Russia is very much preoccupied with uh, Ukraine, but it has now a new and closer relationship with uh, Iran. Iran uh, now uh, openly supporting Russia with uh, drones in uh, in Ukraine. Um, uh, more generally, and this is one of the the major points I'm arguing in this uh, book, is that the fact that uh, Turkey and Iran fully joined the Middle Eastern uh, system uh, is of huge importance. That throughout much of the 20th century, uh, Turkey want, uh, looked west. It wanted to be part of the uh, European system. Iran was very much preoccupied with uh, domestic issues and with confronting the then Soviet Union. Since 1979, Iran, after the Islamic Revolution, uh, is very much focused on exporting the revolution to Middle Eastern countries. And Turkey, since the uh, first years of, uh, of uh, this uh, century, uh, having been rebuffed by Europe, is uh, very much focused on the Middle East. Now, these are two very major players. I mean, countries of more than 90 million, almost 100 million strong economies, uh, uh, strong militaries, uh, highly developed civil societies. And they, when once they joined the fray in the Middle East, um, it, it uh, affected, uh, transformed the Middle East uh, regional system. Okay. Um, uh, the questions are now beginning to come in uh, in their numbers from our audience. And so I'm going to move now to my very dear friend and colleague in the UCLA Department of Public Policy, a former Los Angeles County Supervisor, Los Angeles City Council, Councilman Zeb Yaroslavsky. And he has a pretty provocative question, Ambassador. He's asking, wants to know how concerned you are about Ben Gvir being put in charge of this newly created National Guard. And the question from uh, Supervisor Yaroslavsky is, does it seem to you that this Israeli National Guard, this new entity, can, is comparable to the Wagner Group from Putin? Um, and could be designed to um, put down the kind of uh, civil society awakening that is underway in Israel, putting down the protests and and creating some kind of a dictatorship. Uh, no, first of all, uh, I'd like to say hello to, to Zev uh, Yerushalski, whom I, I met when I was myself a graduate student at, uh, at UCLA many years ago. Um, Second, uh, yeah, you know the, the whole Ben Gvir phenomenon is uh, is very disturbing to Israelis like like myself. I mean, this is a man uh, who was convicted several times for supporting terrorism. Uh, he never sat in jail, but he, he was convicted several times uh, for several rounds of voting. His uh, list was disqualified by the Supreme Court, and for some reason, the Supreme Court yielded and allowed him to run, and he's done well by running a very smart campaign. Um, but uh, we have this, this person now in an in a important position in the government. He's in charge of uh, domestic security. And he wants uh, his own militia. And Netanyahu, Netanyahu is, uh, I, I would say in brackets, this Netanyahu of today is not Netanyahu of five years ago or 10 years ago. He's a much weaker uh, uh, prime minister. Um, I don't know why he had to yield to uh, to Ben Gvir. I mean, Ben Gvir would never leave this government, would never leave this coalition. It may be his only chance to be in uh, in government. And when he, uh, in order to get his support to postpone the enactment of the laws regarding the judicial reform, he gave him the permission to form this uh, militia. But Netanyahu is also known for making promises and not necessarily keeping them. So many Israelis uh, believe that it may not happen so soon. And of course, we still have the Supreme Court and uh, there will be injunctions, people pointing to the fact that you cannot have uh, such a, a police force not subject to the... Uh, we have one national police. Israel doesn't have several police forces. Uh, outside this uh, form under the authority of a politician, and the Supreme Court may also have a say. So uh, I've got a few questions now, and I'll just take them in, in order, just so the audience knows how I'm selecting them. 
Uh, the next question from Eric Selkov in the United States uh, takes us back to the uh, current uh, crisis in Israel. A very interesting question. Uh, Mr. Selkov wants to know whether uh, there is some, some logic maybe uh, on the side of those who do want to see some reform uh, at the court, uh, whether it's the selection process, whether it's the override uh, provision. Uh, and I would just add to the question that uh, Benny Gantz has expressed some willingness to reach a compromise, to negotiate. Uh, maybe uh, two thirds uh, majority, 80 out of 120 for an override. Um, and so is there is there an argument that can be made that uh, that that uh, perhaps there is some some room here for a compromise um, involving some modicum of of change? Undoubtedly. A reform, I would be the first to support, and many, many of the my friends or the people who together with me demonstrate or uh, protest uh, against this uh, 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 bribe uh, would accept the notion of, of reform. Let's begin. The uh, selection process can be modified somewhat. Um, the override can be uh, accepted. There's the whole issue of basic laws. Uh, what is a basic law? How it, how it should be enacted. Um, no question that the uh, judicial, uh, the courts are clogged. It takes five years sometimes to get the, the case through. There's a lot to be done. And the, the very notion of reform, I think is acceptable to, to everyone. The, 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 uh, the crucial issue is in the selection process is, will the coalition have a majority in the selection of uh, judges? or will it not? And I think over this, you will not see a compromise. Over the other issues, you can very well see a compromise. Yeah, but maybe you could just quickly describe the current system and how the proposal would change it in terms of selection. Yeah, the current system is that uh, there is a committee. In the committee, you have uh, judges from the Supreme Court. You have representatives of the of the parliament with a majority of, uh, of, of the coalition. And uh, you have uh, two representatives of the bar. It's a crazy, and of course, it's not a perfect system. And everybody knows that in, in years past, deals were made between different uh, actors. Yes, that in years past, the uh, president, uh, the Supreme Court itself, had a lot of say in selecting its uh, fresh members. Uh, no question also that there is underrepresentation of what we call Second Israel, of people from Middle Eastern uh, origins. And uh, I and many others would like to see more judges representing, more broadly representing the, the population of the country uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, how exactly to, to do that without giving the, uh, the government too much of a say should be negotiated. But the changes of this kind, uh, you know, broadly acceptable. And I would just add under the current, please correct me, Ambassador, if I'm wrong, under the current system, the committee has nine members, as you just described, seven of nine have to agree, which means no single block has the unilateral ability to appoint a member of the court. Uh, well, under the only, proposed, of the Supreme, only of the Supreme Court, not, that's for, correct, Supreme uh, court. not for district or, 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 the law, uh, or the lower courts. And there is also the question of, who would be the next president of the Supreme Court? The, the current president uh, is uh, retiring uh, at the end of the year. And of course, the identity of uh, her successor uh, is a very important uh, issue. So uh, these, these, uh, these issues uh, are at the forefront of the current disagreement. And the under the proposed change, only five out of nine votes would be required. Enough, to and yeah, which would enable the government to just nominate uh, the judges it wants. Yeah? And then, of course, the, the whole process of uh, confirmation uh, doesn't exist in Israel. Yeah. Right. Um, and I would just, uh, in terms of your um, plea for more diversity on the court, I do believe that uh, last year, the first uh, Muslim Arab uh, member of the court was appointed, one out of 15 uh, to yeah, start. Not the first. Uh, Another no, 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 For many years, we've had an Arab member okay. of, of the court. There are Orthodox members. There are also 
members from Middle Eastern countries, but not enough mm -hmm. of them. Okay, well, our next question happens to be from a judge, but he's not asking about the judicial reform in Israel. He's asking about something else. Uh, another very close friend of mine, uh, the Honorable Michael Bailson, senior federal judge, United States District Judge from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Ambassador, he would like to ask uh, your opinion about the, the leadership. How do you assess the leadership or lack of leadership, as you would say, that Prime Minister Netanyahu is demonstrating with respect to the very tense situation with Iran right now? Uh, Iran marching forward um, with its nuclear program. The JCPOA appears to be uh, off the table. Um, and does Prime Minister Netanyahu have strong popular support in Israel with respect to his handling of the Iran issue? And does this give him any uh, broader support with respect to internal issues that you've already been discussing? So focus on Iran. Thank you for the question. Uh, um, the, uh, well, first of all, Netanyahu's approval ratings uh, plummeted in, uh, in recent poll. For the first time, Benny Gantz has, uh, and, and he has more than uh, has a higher percentage, and Yair Lapid has the same percentage as Netanyahu, which has not been the case in the past. Um, and the public at large, even, and again, in the polls, we see that many Likud voters are not happy uh, with, the, with the performance. And many ask themselves, uh, you know, we are a country with huge uh, problems and, and issues. Why focus? Uh, in such a massive way on, on this legal reform and neglect issues such as Iran's uh, racing for a uh, for nuclear weapon and why uh, why, embar uh, why embarrass the United States why um, get uh, get into a feud with the president of the United States when you need the United States to deal with the Iranian uh, issue these are questions that are being asked uh, uh, all the time um, and uh, um, part of the the larger criticism that uh, you find in uh, yeah, you find in a country, and I would say, since you mentioned Netanyahu and, and Iran, and since we also meant, of course, on the mind of many Americans is the fact that former President Trump is uh, is now being in uh, arraigned in a court in uh, uh, in New York. Uh, the decision by Netanyahu and Trump to, to get out of the JCPOA, uh, which uh, at the time seemed, and today in retrospect, certainly seems like a very erroneous decision. I mean, Trump did not manage to bring Iran, quote-unquote, down to its knees to sanctions. And uh, the JCPOA may not have been a perfect agreement. There were many weak points in it, but it was something uh, in a way, stopping or slowing down Iran's race for a nuclear weapon, and it has not been replaced by anything approximating it. So our next question is about Syria, uh, and you are one of the leading experts, if not the leading expert uh, in the world on Syria. You've written several books uh, about Syria, one that we, uh, we hosted you a couple of years ago, on a book regarding a book about Syria that you had written. Um, the question is from Nikolai Surkov in Russia, um, who wants uh, to have your assessment for the uh, very dramatic increase in the intensity of Israeli airstrikes in Syria over the last few weeks. Uh, is there a risk of further escalation with Iran, for example, to distract the Israeli public uh, from the current crisis internally by creating an external crisis? Yeah, uh, yeah it, it's an, it's an uh, obvious uh, anxiety or uh, speculation to, uh, to think of, uh, but uh, no, I'll give the government the credit that it, it conducts the foreign and security policy uh, on their merits. Uh, there is a real issue. I mean, uh, Iran is uh, establishing itself in, in Syria. And now, of course, uh, the, the question came from, from Russia. Uh, there was in the aftermath of the Syrian civil war, both collaboration and tension between uh, uh, Russia and, uh, and Iran. 
now that Russia needs Iran uh, in, in Ukraine, there's less tension and more, more cooperation, and the Iranians are digging in. Now, Iran has, uh, through Hezbollah, a very large stockpile of uh, rockets and missiles in, in Lebanon as a deterrent against Israel. But uh, it also wants to have one in Syria, not through Hezbollah, but uh, directly under its own uh, control. We are determined to prevent them uh, uh, from doing that. And there has been an escalation. We, we saw recently uh, uh, the first, uh, apparently in collaboration, Iran and Hezbollah sending a, a terrorist into, in, into Israel with a very large uh, <clears throat> explosive charge. It fortunately ended with just uh, wounding one person, but could have caused major damage. That was the first uh, attempt by Hezbollah to perpetrate something like that inside Israel. The other day, uh, apparently an Iranian drone from Syria crossed the border into Israel and was shut down. So you have a slow but uh, alarming uh, escalation in the uh, uh, conflict between Israel and uh, Iran in Syria. Israel is, is careful not to do it in Lebanon. He doesn't want it to get into another, into a, another round of fighting with Hezbollah. So it's all done in a way by proxy uh, in Syria. Um, and could you just comment on Lebanon? This is my question. Um, the, following the terrible explosion at the Beirut port a couple of years ago, there was a great deal of anger internally in Lebanon at, uh, at Hezbollah, which doesn't seem to have over time really made much of a difference. Um, although, uh, one, of course, favorable development from the Lebanese perspective, I suppose, is the gas deal with Israel a few months ago. Uh, what is the current state of play uh, in Lebanon with respect to Israel and Iran? Well, Iran is uh, indirectly in control in Lebanon through Hezbollah. Hezbollah uh, doesn't want to take power in Lebanon. It, it wants to have power without responsibility. So it is represented in the government, but it's uh, the power not behind the throne, but beyond the throne. And it's happy with that uh, state of affairs. Um, but Lebanon is in, in terrible shape. And no electricity, no, no running water, of course, the explosion you, uh, uh, you mentioned. And uh, as long as Hezbollah and Iran are in, in control, um, I, don't, I, don't see a, I don't see a remedy. And I, I'd like to uh, address a larger question. And Lebanon, you say, is a classic case of what political scientists call fate state, and where the, the government has no real control over its uh, sovereign uh, territory. But it's not the only failed state in, uh, in the Middle East. There are six of them. And I think we, we may have to rethink the notion of a failed state, because if a failed state remains a failed state for 15 or 20 years, uh, maybe the term needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be changed. But uh, it's a sad comment on uh, the state of the region, of course. Yeah. Uh, so another question about the uh, judicial reform proposals in Israel. Uh, for this question from Phil Isaac of the United States. Uh, he notes that today uh, we are having an election in Wisconsin uh, for a member of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. There are several other states that elect lower court and higher court judges at the state level. Um, at the federal level, of course, they are not elected. They are, uh, as you mentioned before, ambassador appointed, nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, but with the election process that we see at the state level in the United States perhaps make sense uh, in, is in Israel, direct election of either lower court or high court judges. Personally, I, I'm not in favor of that. I think that the election leads to politicization and uh, judges in order to be elected or re-elected would have to carry favor with uh, the public or elements of, of the public would be beholden. There's a question of uh, campaign finance that is uh, uh, one of the problems with American politics. So um, I don't think that uh, we need to import this, uh, uh, this aspect of the American legal system into ours. Okay. 
Uh, next is from uh, Ilya Glukovsky at UCLA, a uh, member of the UCLA faculty, uh, who points out that there currently appears, with respect to the Palestinian track, there currently appears to be no partner on the other side, if you will. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, is weak and becoming weaker and so forth. But in any event, uh, uh, Professor Gukowski would like to know what is your perspective, Ambassador, uh, as to whether there's any, any realistic chance of, uh, of coming to some settlement of the Palestinian uh, issue and moving toward a two-state solution. Um, I personally would very much hope so, um, because the alternative to uh, to this would be a one. Uh, I don't use the term one-state solution because one state is not a solution; it's a it's a predicament. Uh, but uh, so uh, I hope that we can go back to uh, negotiating a settlement, or if it's impossible to negotiate, that we even take unilateral action. Um, to uh, to prevent that from from happening. Right now, the situation, of course, is not favorable to that. As I mentioned, we have a very right wing uh, government, uh, elements of which would actually want to uh, annex the West Bank and uh, create a one state, but they think they can cope with that. I don't know how, but that's what they think. Uh, secondly, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, is waning. I mean, uh, Abu Mazen uh, is an older, is an old man. Uh, there is the question of transition and succession, and it remains to be seen who succeeds Abu Mazen when the time comes and, and what happens next. And will there be a Palestinian authority capable of negotiating? And then, of course, in Gaza, you have a separate uh, government by Hamas. And very importantly, uh, the United States it uh, is uh, indispensable for making uh, Arab-Israeli agreements, uh, is not there for this. The uh, order of priorities for the Biden administration is different, with, both internationally with China and Ukraine and uh, so many other international uh, issues, uh, major domestic uh, uh, issues. And uh, the Biden administration is not going to try to relaunch in Israeli-Palestinian uh, negotiation. What it would like to do is to keep the status quo uh, against difficult uh, odds. So uh, this is the best you can, uh, we can even hope for now that the status quo is not altered and kept until uh, uh, better times arrive. So Johnny Joseph of the United States and Doris Awad of Palestine are both asking about the prospects for a constitution. You mentioned Israel does not have a constitution. Uh, Johnny Joseph wants to know what impediments are there to adopting a constitution for Israel. And uh, Doris Awad wants to know whether the uh, 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 development or uh, ratification of a constitution for Israel could be a solution uh, for controlling uh, the actions of the kind of government that we see now reaching for more power uh, and also for controlling future governments as well in Israel. Yeah, they, uh, uh, this idea is being floated. Um, there, were, there were earlier attempts to draft a constitution that failed. And now uh, some, some people argue that maybe this would be an opportunity to try to uh, revive the, uh, the idea. Um, I'm afraid this is not going to happen. And uh, go back to our founding father, David Ben Gurion, who decided in '49 that uh, a constitution could not be drafted because of two issues: the uh, uh, rela the role of religion, uh, religion and the state. Uh, find a formula that is acceptable to both uh, Orthodox, ultra Orthodox, and secular uh, Jews in the country, and secondly, to define the relationship of the state and it's a 20% uh, Arab minority. I don't see that this can be uh, overcome anytime soon. So uh, an interim uh, solution is to take the Declaration of Independence. That is uh, a very good document formulated with the establishment of, uh, of the state in 48 and, and give it more volume and power. 
uh, as not not as a constitution, but as a, um, a federalist paper or the, the equivalent of one of the of these uh, documents that uh, contributed so much to the constitutional evolution of the United States at the time. Um, so our next question is from a graduate student, Abdel Karim Skouri, who is studying international security at Luis University in Rome, Italy. And uh, he would like to know whether you believe in the potential of the Abraham Accords to create either in the short or the medium term, uh, what he describes as a sort of regional security architecture uh, for the uh, Middle East region, sort of an Arab NATO or Arab Israeli NATO, or uh, maybe perhaps a Middle East Air Defense Alliance. Maybe how do you how do you think about this? Um, I'm afraid it's not very likely. Uh, immediately after the signing of the Abraham Accords, there was talk about uh, something approaching or approximating this idea. Um, but uh, of course, all speculation ended when Saudi Arabia uh, now fixed its relationship with uh, with Iran because the purpose of a defensive organization would be to to protect the the weaker Sunni Arab states against Iran, and they, they've chosen a, a, a different path. But what you see and what you will continue to see is the security cooperation uh, between Israel and some of the signatories. Israel is now in uh, uh, CENTO. Um, we collaborate uh, joint exercises. I think this, this will continue, and this is the format that is uh, com uh, the, the Arab parties to the Abraham Accords uh, feel comfortable with. And let me just add my own question there. Uh, Israel and Morocco, Morocco, one of the four parties to the Abraham Accords, Israel and Morocco entered into some sort of um, defense pact. And I know I'm, 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 I'm not defining it exactly as it occurred, but um, what is the significance there? And it is, uh, of course, it's a relationship that uh, has existed uh, for decades now, sometimes under the table and sometimes over the table. And uh, unlike the relationship that Israel has with uh, countries in the Gulf and so forth, there is the issue of a very, very large uh, Moroccan Jewish community that emigrated in part to France, but in large part to, to Israel. And they feel a particular attachment to Morocco and Morocco feels uh, so an ongoing relationship with, with that community, that is a, an important component. Um, and yes, the, uh, the defense relationship between Israel and Morocco has been reinforced now. Um, but there is no, uh, Morocco is not going to be, I mean, it is in, in the Maghreb, it is uh, far in the West. Some of the concerns that uh, Gulf countries facing Iran have, Morocco doesn't have. What, uh, what it was concerned with in, uh, in the Western Sahara, it received from President Trump as part of the, uh, of the deal. So what we will see would, would, would be a growing uh, defense collaboration, but not any, uh, any pact or turning Morocco into part of uh, a regional uh, military alliance with Israel. Um, our friend uh, Sima Kalicholu from Turkey has another question. And then before I get to that question, let me just indicate there's a, apparently a little bit of glitchiness with my Wi-Fi. I apologize for that. I'm not in my usual location. And so if, if, if you're experiencing um, uh, difficulty hearing me, I apologize. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. And so let me get to Sima's uh, second question, which relates to uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan and Iran's uh, relations are very tense right now. Some think that's partly due to Azerbaijan's uh, decision to send an ambassador to Israel. Um, and uh, this tension could embroil Turkey. Um, how do you see this situation playing out? I'm not sure I would use the term embroil. I mean, Turkey clearly uh, was very helpful to Azerbaijan in the in the recent uh, uh, mini war with uh, with Armenia in Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, Israel or Israeli companies are a major provider of 
military equipment to Azerbaijan. Uh, it's an open secret that uh, Azerbaijan is a, in a strategic location on, on the borders of Iran and a very good vantage point for, uh, for Israel. If Iran is present on our borders in Gaza and in Lebanon and in Syria, we are present on its border in, uh, in Azerbaijan. So it's uh, sort of an uh, equilibrium, a very important relationship for Israel and, and one in which uh, Israel and Turkey are actually on the same side. So uh, thank you, Ambassador. And we do have just about uh, seven minutes left. If anybody has um, a last question, now's the time. Uh, Eric Seklov from the United States has a second question, uh, which I will shorten a little bit. Uh, he's asking about uh, the topic you mentioned earlier, the um, Chinese brokered rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now it seems that the Syrians and the Saudis are drawing closer again. Uh, maybe China uh, is involved, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but the larger question here that Eric is asking is, is the United States of America being replaced in the region by China or some, some combination of China and Russia as the key outside player in the region? I would say not replaced, but uh, losing, losing space. Um, and a word about the, the Syrian-Saudi normalization of relations, the renewal of diplomatic relations. Uh, you know, I, Bashar Assad was a pariah at the, during and after the civil war, as somebody who you know, inflicted uh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of deaths and, uh, on, on his own civilian population, he has five million of his own countrymen outside Syria with no wish to take them back and so forth and so forth, but he's, he's, uh, the, he survived the civil war, he's in power, and uh, slowly but surely, more and more Arab countries are normalizing with him, and I suspect European countries will follow suit. Uh, when, even when uh, there will be a, a reconstruction of Syria, it would be a huge business, and many would like to be part of it. Will Bashar be able to reestablish the Syria that his father ruled? Uh, no, at this point he controls between 60 and 70 percent of his own territory. You know, Turkey is in, uh, practically annexed about 8 percent. You have in Idlib uh, an autonomous uh, area. You have the Kurdish area uh, in the uh, northeast. You have American presence. You have Russian and uh, uh, Iranian presence. You have all kinds of militias, uh, foreign militias on Syrian soil. Uh, this is still not a normal country. This is why uh, my, the book I, I wrote and you refer to is called Syrian Requiem. Not a very happy title. So this is gonna be the last question, um, Ambassador. And, and before we get to the last question. Oh, wait, no, we do have a question that just came in. Uh, and so maybe we'll have time for two, but this is from Hamid Ahmadi from the University of Tehran in Iran. His question is, there is talk that the United States and Israel have agreed to a limited form of the JCPOA with Iran. Uh, what is your view on this? Are these rumors true? It's not a question of a view, it's a question of uh, information, of veracity. I'm, I'm not aware of any, any development of this kind. Okay, so then there is time for one last question and I will ask it. Um, your book, Middle Eastern Maze, covers uh, a very long period of history, 74 years from 1948 to 1922. And focusing on your country, Ambassador Israel, over those 74 years, uh, what would you say were Israel's greatest uh, triumphs, achievements? I don't mean on the battlefield, I mean diplomatically, politically. And what were its greatest failures or missed opportunities? Um, I think uh, Israel's greatest exploit was to establish itself. I mean, you know, a country of just over a million people at the end of uh, the, what we call the War of Independence, the 1948 war. A, a very small country, barely existing, very small 
population. Uh, it integrated the uh, 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 remnants of the Holocaust. It integrated the refugees from uh, Middle Eastern countries. It is now a country of 9 million um, with a strong economy, uh, very strong, impressive uh, high-tech industry, uh, great exploits in, in medicine, and in uh, science, and it, you know, it's uh, if you look back, uh, it's it's been a very impressive um, achievement for not just founding the state but also building it. And that I think is 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 the most important achievement diplomatically. I think forging a very close alliance with the United States, making peace with the two Arab countries, and then adding to them the countries of the Abraham Accord. Uh, again, very encouraging compared to the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, in its uh, heyday. Um, our greatest failure was uh, our inability to deal with uh, um, uh, the outcome of the 67 war. Uh, we negotiated with uh, Egypt, we negotiated with Jordan, uh, the negotiation with Syria failed to produce an outcome, and we have the Palestinian uh, issue that is the single most important problem that the state of Israel uh, faces. Uh, our inability to deal with that problem is our greatest failure. Okay, well, on that note, maybe not the happiest of notes, but on that note, uh, I want to thank you, Ambassador Rabinovich, for uh, sharing your wisdom, your experience, uh, your vast knowledge with our audience today. We really appreciate you taking time to be with us. I also want to thank our co-sponsors again, the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, as well as the Department of Public Policy at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. And I want to thank the amazing staff at the Center for Middle East Development, CMED at UCLA, Deputy Director Manny Jad, uh, Salome Mahajer, and Emily Pistol for their tremendous work putting this webinar together. Please um, take note of the um, uh, websites that you see there on the screen. Uh, we'd love donations for the Center for Middle East Development for many of you who may be so inclined, uh, but I also hope uh, that each of you will uh, make it a point to um, acquire a copy of Ambassador Rabinovich's latest book, Middle Eastern Maze, and um, really dive into what is an incredibly important contribution to our understanding of this very, very, very complex part of the world. With that, I'll bid you farewell. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.